Hi guys, thanks for checking out Next Level Carpentry. I'm working second shift here in the shop tonight after setting cabinets all day uh, at the day job and I need to move this um, bookcase build project forward. Uh, the wide shelves that you see in the video thumbnail, uh, I'm still building those and I'm um, going to do a few steps on that tonight so I just thought I'd shoot the video intro uh, to lead into that. The parts I've got here, uh, this is hard maple, exactly three quarters of an inch thick exactly two inches wide and these uh, pieces are made uh, very precisely that's important for the way these shelves go together you can see in this panning shot just how accurate these parts are and to get them that way I run them all through the thickness planer for the very final pass so that each piece is identical in width and the edges are smooth and ready to sand so I've got 12 of these edges for the fronts of the shelves and it's a bad camera angle but you can see the stack of plywood here for the shelves. Uh, each shelf gets made of uh, two pieces of this plywood. And you can see here the accuracy and precision of all these parts. They're exactly the same width and exactly the same length. And they're just a little bit short here so that they can slip in and out uh, of the cabinet without scratching the sides. And I'm not going to go into all the steps I used to make these parts so accurate here. Uh, if you're interested in seeing that process uh, for getting precision parts like this out of uh, full sheets of material, check out the video link up here where I make these, uh, where I go through the same steps for making drawer parts. Uh, but I use those steps shown in that video to get to this stage here. Uh, the next step is to uh, fit these um, hardwood pieces to the front of the shelves. So I'll get set up and do that now. Uh, to make assembly of these uh, shelves consistent and accurate, the way I do it is to put a shallow rabbit in the back of each of these one by pieces. The rabbit, uh, the width of the rabbit is exactly the thickness of the plywood and the depth of the rabbit is a strong sixteenth of an inch. And there's a lot of ways to make rabbits like this, but I found the quickest, most accurate, and consistent method is to use the table saw for making them. I'll use uh, a full 1 8 inch kerf Freud rip blade, and this is a flat top grind. Each tooth uh, just has a flat top as opposed to the alternating top bevel on a lot of rip blades. And then I'll use my forest blade stabilizer for a smooth, cheddar free cut. And the goal here is to set the blade height at precisely the thickness of the plywood. And I'll always start out ever so slightly low so that I can sneak up on that height. Notice I'm using a cut edge of this scrap and not a factory end. Those factory ends tend to swell. And if I set the saw blade to that, it will likely be too deep of a rabbit or too wide for the cut edges of the plywood. I've got this little piece of scrap material that was left over when I cut the shelf faces. And I'll use that to set this rabbit before I move to the actual pieces. I set the rip fence to the full thickness of the facing material and then watch the vernier on the rip fence to slide the fence over another 364 of an inch for this practice rabbit. And you can see it's ever so slightly shallow, which is what I want. And this dial caliper shows me I'm about a 64th of an inch shallow of the 330 seconds rabbit that I want. And I do mean 330 seconds because I think I said 364 earlier. So I'll change the blade height ever so slightly, move the fence ever so slightly, and take another pass to dial this in like that. This is precisely the right depth here, which is what I need to end up with. Once I'm happy with my rabbit sample, I mark it that way in case I need to check the setup at any point during the work. Once I've got the blade and the fence set up for rabbiting, I'll go through all the shelf facing pieces. Obviously, I'll rabbit the less desirable face of each piece, and I mark it with a double X to show the rabbits so that I can rabbit them all at the same time with the same setup. Some of the pieces, there's a little bit of wane from the milling process, but I was able to use these pieces because I know that that wane is going to go away with the rabbit. And you've heard of it raining cats and dogs, but have you ever heard of it waning rabbits? And every piece of wood has an A face and a B face. And this selection process helps me to optimize to put the best face forward and hide defects and character flaws in the wood. Once I've finished the selecting and marking process, I stack all the shelf facing pieces in the same orientation. So there's less of a chance of rabbiting the wrong face of one of these strips. 
Then I fire up the dust processor and get after it. And I keep my favorite push stick close at hand for this process so that I can push the pieces through quickly, smoothly, and safely. And with that setup and process, it doesn't take long to put uh, 24 precision rabbits on the back of 12 of these shelf edge pieces. Everyone is the same depth and the same width as the next, and they all fit the plywood perfectly. I'll mention that these pieces are all uh, just rough length. They'll get trimmed later in the process. Once the rabbiting is done, the two shelf pieces will go on here like so, which leaves exactly a half inch in between. I need to maintain that half inch space between the top and the bottom uh, pieces of plywood on each shelf. And I'll do that with spacers fit in between to maintain a parallel shelf thickness. And a consistent shelf thickness is important for two reasons. One, for the look of the shelves, but the other is for the hidden clip system that I use for allowing these uh, shelves to be adjustable for height, yet slip in and out easily. These shelves will have the appearance of being two inches thick. Uh, that just fits with the design I'm doing. That width can be anything, like three, four, five inches, whatever you're thinking. The process is the same, the dimensions are different. Um, this front piece being that width, and these two rabbits on the back will help me achieve that thickness by putting two pieces of this plywood on here, and that, that holds the front at two inches, but the back is just gonna collapse like this. So I'll put something in there to prevent that. Uh, here's some half inch material. I could just slip that in there and glue this together. Uh, it could go the long way like this, and um, that would hold the shelf parallel at two inches thick. But the way these shelves install in the bookcase I've got uh, concealed shelf clips, uh, like a concealed shelf clip bar that goes in each end. I'm going to make those one inch wide, and so I need to put these spacers in the bottom of these shelves so that they're exactly one inch in from the end, and then uh, one on each end like that. And then I want to put some in the middle just to keep uh, the shelf from collapsing or swelling. And to do that, uh, I'm not going to just cut strips and shoot them on there with a nail gun or anything because uh, then I'd have to do a bunch of measuring and indexing to get all that accurate. So what I've done here is set up a three-quarter inch dado blade in the saw. And I've done this setup so that the blade is exactly an inch from the fence and it's cutting out dado a sixteenth of an inch deep. It looks like this on my test sample. I just run the piece through like this and it puts a shallow dado one inch in from the end. And with this setup, uh, the dado blade and the rip fence do all the measuring. Uh, once I got this set up, I don't have to measure anything. I'll just run each shelf through, uh, one pass on each end, so there'll be one dado or one spacer uh, one inch in from the end of the shelves. I guess I've said that enough times. This is what it looks like. Naturally, I've chosen the best face for the outside of the shelf. So these dados are going in the, the B face, not the A face of each of these shelf pieces. I'll go through the whole stack and put this first dado on each end of all those pieces and then switch the setup for an additional pair of uh, grooves. And I want to point out a number of things that might not be obvious while I'm doing this process. I've run the dados in both ends of all these pieces. And uh, uh, the first thing is, like I pointed out in the beginning of the video, each one of these shelves is its precise finished size. Uh, the length and the width are precisely the way I want them so that I'm um, making this groove uh, to register uh, the spacer strip off a finished end. I don't want to um, put this groove in here and then have to trim off the end so that it's an inch away from the groove. I'll make the end first and put the groove later. Hope that makes sense. Uh, the second thing is wearing gloves. Um, it's kind of irritating to get comments about wearing gloves in a workshop because of the obvious danger of getting uh, fabric caught in a blade and having it pull your hand into a piece of equipment. 
But for a procedure like this, the opposite's true. Um, when I'm running the dado, I've got to put pressure down and in, down to the table and into the fence as I push through uh, to make the cut um, an accurate depth and an accurate distance from the end. When I'm doing that, I've got my hands here. If I don't have a glove, uh, or I have leather gloves or something that's not sticky. If I'm pushing and my hand slips, yeah. Um, so I don't want that to happen. And I wear these gloves to prevent it. I call them Smurf gloves. They're Atlas Showa gloves, and they're really sticky. Um, and then uh, when I have them in a the shop for a while, they get dirty. I uh, just throw them in the washing machine, and then they're sticky again. It helps me get the grip I need for these pieces. And another important thing here is uh, the dado blade I'm using. That's uh, the Forest Dado King, in my humble opinion, the best dado blade on the market. That's what it looks like. And I use that blade anytime I'm working with veneered material. You can see the crispness of the edges of this dado, and that's because of the Dado King's design. If you look at the ends of the dado, you can see a little point right there on each side. I hope that focuses. And what those two little nicks are from are from these outside blades on the Forest Dado King set. You can see the sharp angle here on this tooth. The next tooth is just flat. Every other tooth has a sharp angle and the angles are opposite for the inside and the outside blades. So that little point on that tooth scores through and cuts the veneer before the rest of the chippers pull the material out of the middle, making for a flawlessly clean and smooth groove. You can see this little flare of material in here. That's because the dado blade set with just the outside blades and the chippers is 20 thousandths of an inch less than three quarters of an inch for this cut. And that little flare of wood is left by the, an eight thousandths and a 12 thousandths shim that I use in the dado set to get exactly three quarters of an inch. And it's not really critical in this application that that groove is so precisely three quarters of an inch, but I made it that way because I could. As I said earlier, because I don't want these shelves to collapse or expand, I need a couple more spacer bars in the middle. Now I could put one right in the middle, but it would have to be precisely in the middle, and I don't feel like going through the setup to accomplish that. So I'm just going to put two of them, and that way they'll be indexed from the ends. Everything will space out just right. Um, I'm not sure if that makes sense, but it will if you try it. Anyways, uh, the quickest way uh, to space this out is to subtract the width of two more spacer bars at three quarters of an inch each or an inch and a half and then divide the remaining measurement by three. That gives me 27 and 15 sixteenths so I'm going to call that nine and a quarter. So I'll just go nine and a quarter on that side and about nine and a quarter on this side. And that spaces the dado. Look at that exactly 11 inches from the rip fence. And so for better positioning of the workpiece while applying these secondary dados, I flip the rip fence around back to the right hand side of the blade, set the fence at 11 inches, and then proceed to plow these shallow dados. Because I'm committing this whole stack of shelves, I double check my fence setting just to be comfortable before I commit to cutting these pieces. And this time I'm pushing the board down and in to the fence on the right instead of the left. And that's all it takes to have perfectly spaced dados on the bottom of each shelf face. And a couple more things to keep in mind here is that my rip fence has to be precisely parallel to the blade and square to the table so that these dados come out parallel to the ends of the shelves. And pay close attention during an operation like this so that no little chips of wood or sawdust get between the end of the shelf and the rip fence. Because an errant splinter or chip would hold the shelf out of square to the fence and the dado would be out of square as well. Another thing that I do here on occasion when running end grain against the rip fence is to take a piece of paraffin. This is actually cross country ski wax. And I just wipe it along the bottom side of the rib fence there. And that helps the pieces glide easily and effortlessly along the fence when making a cut like this, where a sticky fence would probably mean a spoiled piece. And keep in mind that this is a shallow dado cut that I'm making here, so I'm not off cutting pieces between the blade and the fence as a cross cut. If the way I'm going about this hasn't made sense yet, I hope this will help. Because you can see that the dados are perfectly lined up when the ends of the shelves are flush. And they stay perfectly lined up even when I flip one shelf end for end because they're indexed off the ends of the shelves and not aiming for the center. I could hit that center perfectly if I needed to, but I don't need to. And you got to make it easy on yourself because nobody else is going to do it for you, right?
And another way to look at this is to think about the fact that I used two measurements to perfectly locate 48 dados in the faces of all 12 of these shelves. And it barely took 15 minutes to do it. With all the dados plowed in these shelves, the next thing is to determine the thickness of the spacer. Uh, with no spacer at all, the shelves would be an inch and a half thick. So I need to figure out the space between the shelves plus the depth of two dados to come up with the uh, spacer thickness. I'm shooting for a finished shelf of two inches thick, so that spacer will be a little over a half an inch, but if you want to make four inch thick shelves, uh, the process is the same from here. Uh, the best way I know to figure up the exact thickness of the spacer is to put two shelves back to back like this. And I snug the two shelves together with this clamp and put one of the face bars on the shelf edge. I line up one edge of the shelf facing with the bottom of one dado and then measure from the other edge of the facing back into the bottom of the other dado. And I come up with a difference of a 32nd of an inch less than 5 eighths. So that's what I'm going to go with for the spacer thickness. And I've got six shelves with four spacers each, so I need a total of 24 of those spacers for this project. And I already know that the other dimension for the spacers is exactly three quarters of an inch and the length will be about 12 inches long. And it's routine millwork, so I'm not going to go through all the steps I uh, went through to make these strips that are those dimensions. And there's a link to a video here that shows how I make parts like this. And what's tricky about them is the height and the width are so close to each other, it uh, can be difficult to keep everything organized so that the pieces are all rectangular in shape but you'll see these red lines on the end of the pieces. That's the key to getting strips like this that are very close in dimension, uh, all perfectly accurate, and I got a whole batch of them. So check out that video if you want to know how to do this. But after going through that process, these strips now fit down into the grooves here nicely. like so. And the two halves of the shelves click together with those spacers in between. It takes a little bit of wiggling to line everything up because the tolerances are so tight. But once they're locked into place, everything is clean, neat, and perfect. And the finished thickness of the assembly is identical to the finished thickness of the edging, which is just where I need to be. To avoid any issues and complications during assembly and glue up, I'm going to hold the spacer bars back, oh, a good inch from the front of the shelves. And I'll cut them all at exactly 11 inches long to accomplish that. And I can get three of those spacers out of each one of these strips. So I'm just going to use a quick gang cutting method to cut that whole batch in short order. And if you click the eye in the upper right hand corner of your screen right now, you'll see another video where I show in depth how and why and where I use this gang cutting process at times just like this. First, I tape the bundles together with this tough, sticky frog tape. And then I rough cut the bundle into three sections that are about 11 and a quarter inches long. And then I orient the fresh cut ends of the bundles up against the fence and tape the bundles back together, stacked up with one end all perfectly flush. And then I make one simple measurement of 11 inches to cut all 27 pieces to the exact same length. And that's a pretty quick way to cut all the pieces I need, plus three spares for good measure. Just like that. Looks like I've got a whole collection of Scrabble tiles to boot. And uh, longtime viewers will notice that I switched tape. There was a type of 3M tape that was fantastic for this sort of work. It was sticky and it was tough but they've changed the packaging, they've done something, they've cheapened it out, the tape is too thin, and it just tears too easy. So I'm going to this frog tape. Um, so far, so good. It's everything that it needs to be for this kind of work where I'm not just protecting surfaces, but I'm holding parts together. It's strong enough to have a bit of clamping ability when it's stretched, plus it's easy to see on bare wood. Speaking of that, there's a link in the video description to a dedicated Amazon Influencers page for the various tools and supplies that you see me using in this video to make these shelves. This tape is in that list 
And anything you buy from that list is the same low online price that you expect, but then Amazon uh, pays Next Level Carpentry a bit of their profit as ad fees to the channel that helps support video production here. So I really appreciate it. There's one more step uh, to do on these parts before they're ready for assembly, and I'm going to do that now. The design of this particular bookcase requires a quirk joint between the facing and this plywood. These two pieces aren't going to be sanded smooth and filled as if they were one piece of wood. There's a small quirk joint that separates those two surfaces. And I get that by using a 1 16th inch roundover bit um, in this Bosch Colt router. I do one top corner edge of the shelf and then the mating edge on the back of the facing. And this is what this little detail looks like when complete. Just a nice, clean, accented transition between the two pieces. Even with a Bosch Colt, it's tricky to route a thin edge like this and get consistent results because the router wants to tip on the narrow edge. And to get around that without slowing down, I merely stack all the pieces on edge next to each other and use adjoining pieces to support the router base as each edge is routered. All those additional strips really stabilize the work as I'm doing it, so it goes fast. Once I've got one edge done, I flip them top for bottom and do the others to wrap this up in a few short minutes. And this is what the shelf facing edges look like after routing the quirk joint on them with that 1 16th inch roundover bit. And it's just as easy to do both edges of the tops of these shelf pieces too. And notice how I do a little backwards flick when starting the first corner on each of these shelf pieces. Doing that allows me to route off the end without the danger of the router slipping around the corner and spoiling the end of the piece. It's a small touch, but it really does make a difference in the overall detail quality when the job is done. And I'm using an appropriately high RPM for this and a matching feed rate to avoid splintering the edges of this delicate maple veneer. And that bit of routing takes care of all the fabrication for these shelves. And you can see where that got us. And all those sharp corners and edges on the spacers and the grooves are necessary, but they do require a little bit of fiddling to get everything lined up and organized in the final um, assembly. You can see I'm leaving the spacer stick out a little bit in the back. And I'll do this when I'm gluing up because I can set everything down like this to get everything all uh, oriented on the back side so everything's even. And then the shelf edges will slip down in the face like that. And those get clamped in as well. And with that, you can see what the final assembly is going to look like after glue up. Nice little quirk joint, but a nice smooth feel to everything in the meantime. Obviously, before I glue up, I'll trim the shelf facing to the exact length. And then after the glue is all set and dried, I'll ease the front corners of the shelf facing as well for a smooth, clean, and friendly final feel and final look. Even though the shelf isn't glued up yet, you can see the slot that's left in the end. It's on, the same on both ends of all the shelves. They'll be identical when they're all glued up, and that slot is exactly a half inch thick. It's one inch wide, going back to the spacer block here. And they're just a little bit less than 12 and a half inches long. So the next thing I'm going to do is make strips that fit in that slot because they're the invisible hardware that makes these shelves sturdy when installed, but also adjustable when complete. I use the same process for milling these shelf clip strips as I did for milling the spacers. And after getting them straight on the joiner and rough ripping them on the table saw, I use the DW735 thickness planer to mill them all to precisely the same thickness and width. And then finish up using the gang cutting process to cut all these strips exactly the same length at 12 and a quarter inches. And as with all gang cutting operations, I've cut a few extras so I have spares and I use those spares for layout, setup, templating, and patterns. Another benefit of using the gang cutting process rather than a stop block setup is that I can gang route one corner on each end of these pieces. And I switched to a 3 16 inch roundover bit for knocking off those sharp corners for these finished shelf clips. 
And while they're still all taped together, I can gang sand them to remove the burn marks from the router bit on this maple. Because this maple burns quicker than a stack of dry leaves on a hot fall day. I built a slip joint into these shelf clip bars by cutting them at a point midway between the two shelf pegs and then cutting an eighth inch slot and using a piece of eighth inch aluminum bar stock as a spline. And that makes the front section and the back section of the shelf clip bars slightly different in length because of the placement of the shelf clip pegs relative to the side of the bookcase. And once again, I'll use the handy gang cutting method to cut all 12 bars into 24 sections with one quick, simple cut. And then I quickly cut a slot for a spline in one end of each of these pieces on the table saw using that full kerf flat top grind rip blade, the rip fence as a guide, and the miter gauge as a safety block to push the stock past the blade. And with accurate setup, that slot is perfectly centered between the two faces of these pieces. And I mark all these shelf clip pieces with Sharpie marks, a blue line in the back and a green line in the front. So when I'm drilling them on the drill press, I don't get the pieces mixed up. I've got a five millimeter drill bit in the drill press here to drill holes for these five millimeter shelf pegs. The fence is set up to drill the holes centered up side to side in these shelf clip bars. The depth stop is set to 7 16 of an inch, which is half the length of the shelf clip pegs. And then I've got an end stop here that places the holes the correct distance in from the end of the shelf clip bar. This stop is set up for drilling holes in the rear section of the shelf clip bars. And I'll do all those pieces and then move the stop to drill the holes in the front halves of these bars. And the little blue Sharpie mark reminds me that I'm drilling the right hole in the right end of the right piece the first time. Back to the bench, I use a plastic headed hammer to drive these five millimeter by seven eighths inch shelf pegs into the holes I just drilled in the drill press. And the depth of the drilled hole sets the depth I'm able to drive these pins for maximum holding power in both the shelf clip and the cabinet side. And with the shelf clip pieces universally made and assembled, there are cinch to install them in the cabinet. And once the shelf slides over that strip, it'll be as sturdy as ever. And not that I need any more strength for this, but these hidden shelf clip bars are gonna be stronger than regular shelf clips for this setup. And I've never had one of these metal and plastic shelf clips fail. But it gives me a great deal of confidence for the strength and reliability of this hidden shelf clip system. When it comes time to glue up shelves, I'm able to do them two at a time because all the pieces are universally sized and laid out. I simply take spacer bars out of the gang cut bundles, glue the dados, place the block, and wiggle the pieces till everything lines up. By standing the shelves up on the back edge, all the spacer bars slide to the back, which will even up the back edges of the plywood and one end of those spacer bars. It takes a little bit of fussing to make sure all the little spacer blocks are down in their grooves, but once everything snaps together, I'll put the clamps to it. And I hope you can see that by paying attention to detail and accuracy during the design and fabrication process, that the hard part becomes the easy part when glue up goes like a breeze. And I'll take a scrap of my shelf clip stock and slide it down through the notch in the end to clean out any glue squeeze out that might be in that groove that it would get in the way later. And in a couple hours, these shelves will be ready for me to glue up and clamp on their front edges to finish their assembly process. Picking a project out of the clamps is always exciting and just a little bit scary. Because if there's something wrong at a time like this, even a BS-1000 isn't going to help. I just finished gluing and clamping the other four shelves for this project, and I want to stop for a second and ask that You'd consider subscribing to Next Level Carpentry if you haven't already. The subscriber count is approaching 150,000, which is pretty sweet. I really appreciate that. Even if you're already a subscriber, if you like this video enough to hit the thumbs up button, go ahead and give it a poke so that they know over at YouTube things are happening here at Next Level Carpentry. If you like this t-shirt, this is the official BS1000 board stretcher t-shirt. You can get that or any of the other um, t-shirts or posters you see here in the shop at Teespring. There's a link in the video description for that, along with the Amazon Influencers page that has all the tools and supplies you see used here, like these clamps, the glue, hammers, etc. If you need those for a project you're working on and you can't find that stuff locally. And I'll quit the sales pitch now and get back to work. And now for a bit of a moment of truth. Up until this moment, the whole concept for thick adjustable shelves with hidden hardware has been just that, a concept. And what you're seeing here is the world's first installation of these thick adjustable shelves and this unique hidden shelf clip hardware. And that's what it looks like, folks. I think I'll bevel the ends of the back pieces of the shelf clips 
so that the shelf doesn't stop part way through, but that's incredibly strong for displaying any type of art or pottery objects on the shelves. There'll never be an issue with that. And now that the proof of concept is proven, I'll go ahead and glue the front edges on the shelves because I know it's actually going to work. And initially, the spline in these clips was based on necessity because of a slight variance in the distance between the clip holes in the front of the cabinet and in the back. And in the future, using the system, I'd work to make sure those hole lines were parallel. But in experience, I'd still put the spline in here because these clips would be extremely difficult to remove as one solid bar. But when removing the clips, the slight gap between the pieces allows the tips of needle nose pliers to slip in, grab the spline, pull it out, and make removing the clip easier. With the spline design, I can simply remove the spline, which makes removing and reinstalling the clips a whole lot easier. And there's no compromise in the overall strength of the finished clip design. And a slight bevel with a file on the ends of the back pieces will prevent the binding problem forever and always. This is probably getting monotonous, but once again, I'll use the gang cutting process for trimming all the shelf facing pieces to the exact right length. And I start by shaving just a little bit off the best ends of all six of these pieces. And yes, I initially made 12 of the pieces to go with the 12 shelf faces. And it only dawned on me later that in actuality, I only need six facings, not 12. Oh! The second cut for trimming these to length is made by flushing up the freshly cut end with one end of the shelf and then making a clear, crisp mark on the pieces for the exact length of the shelf. And I rely on these PaperMate Sharpwriter pencils for this. They're a mechanical pencil, but the lead comes out by twisting instead of by clicking because the clicking kind always advances too much or too little lead, which means I either can't make the mark or the dang thing snaps off. And making two cuts instead of 12 for cutting both ends of all these pieces is a real time saver. And that is some sticky, strong tape. And I can check these for length by flushing up one end and snapping them into place. Oh no, they're all three quarters of an inch short. What happened? Just kidding, they're perfect. And because I did all my homework right, gluing this front edge on is easy peasy. A thin, modest bead of Tight Bond 3 glue on both plywood edges and three clamps is plenty to glue this up. And viewers of this channel know that I never sweat glue squeeze out, even on a project like this. Because I've got a couple of tips in my arsenal that make the problem of glue squeeze out a non-issue. My first trick is a milkshake straw and a pair of scissors. By folding the straw into a point and slipping it down into that cork joint, I'm able to scoop up the majority of the glue and then a little fine sawdust and a sharpened putty knife clean up anything that's left behind after the straw process. If you remember, I kept the space bars back from the back side of this front facing a good inch and that just prevents any conflict at this point during the glue up. So I get a nice clean fit on the outside with no conflict on the inside. That leaves one shelf down, five to go. Oh yeah. Once all the edges are glued on and the glue's dry, I'll take that Bosch Colt router once again with the 16th inch roundover bit and ease all these edges so they have a nice friendly feel on the finished project. And again, this step just takes a few minutes and really reduces the amount of time spent sanding to get a nice finished detail like this. A fair amount of elapsed time has gone by since I started filming and producing this video and building these shelves. So I asked Chip to come by and slip them into the bookcase so that I can capture a thumbnail image for the video when it gets uploaded. I got me a brand new pair of Smurf gloves. And with all the edges of the shelves routed, they're ready for that because the next step is a final sanding and stain. There's still a fair amount of work to do on the bookcase itself. Everything needs to be sanded and stained uh, along the bottom. There'll be six flat panel doors that go in there. And those got built with a process similar to the link in the video description up here. So if you want to see how I go about building the doors for this cabinet, you can just check out that video. And as I wrap this up, I give a special shout out to everyone who's gone above and beyond by becoming a patron on Patreon. Every name you see on this list is somebody that's made a pledge of support to the channel. With tough economic times ahead, with all this coronavirus stuff, I understand if anybody needs to make adjustments to those commitments. And I want you to know, 
that I appreciate the fact you see enough value in the content here at Next Level Carpentry to make that pledge. So for all you guys and everybody else watching, stay healthy, take care, and until next time, thanks for watching. Catch you later. Thanks a bunch, Chip. Take care. We'll catch you next time. Bye.